Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 631. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's November 13th, Friday the 13th. Three, two, one. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, where George and Kevin sit down and talk about the news of the day, most of it Anglican, most of it Anglican all the time. We'll see what happens today. Before we get too far, we need you as faithful viewers to like the program, share the program. Uh, please go to the comment section and comment on your thoughts of the program. That's where the conversation continues. We never really end the show, and we appreciate your your input to that and if you have not done so please subscribe to the show you do that by clicking on that little red rectangle on our youtube channel up pops a bell you click the bell and supposedly hopefully you'll be instantly notified the next time we have a show uploaded you'll get a little pop-up in your browser says oh Anglican scripted has just uploaded a show you click it and you go oh yay and it's not there that's that's life whatever so before we get too far, George, how's your week going? I'm exhausted, Kevin. Uh, this COVID thing is really, really a pain. Yes, um, it is. Oy. We've we've uh, we've now had in-person services. We've had a month of them, four of them, and we've been averaging. We do five services on a Sunday in person, uh -huh. and uh, we get about a little over a hundred people, which is about on for all of them, which is about. Uh, 35% uh, compa uh, thirty-five percent attendance compared to this time last year. And I know where the other 65% uh, is. They're at home. And with all this latest doom and gloom on the news that, oh, a second wave is coming. New York City is shutting down at 10 o'clock. Uh, Chicago, you can't go to somebody's house for Thanksgiving. Uh, here, everything's fine. Uh, but still people are being frightened now i'm not saying that they shouldn't be frightened but it is discouraging for, for uh, their age demographic a little fear is okay you know absolutely uh we're watching in this country i guess it's the third wave uh and it's amazing how contagious this covid really is we're able to treat it more less people are dying when they hit the icu but darn it all you, even if you're safe and you wear the mask, people are getting it. That's hard. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, third wave, new wave. Next, will we have Billy Idol or something uh, being the being the uh, spokesman for COVID uh, <laughs> relief? Right. You know, do you know how screwed up this country is? Somebody in government gave Billy Idol a green card, and he voted in this last election. Oh, wait, well, who did he vote to? Tell us who he voted. <laughs> Did he voted <laughs> <Donald Trump. laughs> and uh, Johnny Rotten from the That's Sex right. Pistols uh, <laughs> is a Trump supporter. Uh, uh, where's it? Sid Vicious. One of them is dead. Sid, the I other voted for Trump. Vicious, yeah. Okay. So, but it's okay. Johnny oh, died. My. Well, we're getting old, George. Um, old quickly. Yeah. Before we get to the news, there's some. Oh, people always go, Kevin. Where are you? I'm at uh, Gambler Rogers Recreation State Park. It's right outside of Flagler, uh, Florida. We're leaving here today because we're going to go to see the launch at SpaceX, and we have to uh, reposition the camper to get a little bit closer to Kennedy Space Center for that. But that'd be a lot of fun. This is our. Uh, I've never seen one in person, and it's a nighttime launch, so it'll be a lot of fun. Now, have uh, the uh, government been following you because you've got all these antennas on your roof and you'll be driving up to the space <laughs> launch and your yeah. dish will be following you. Uh, uh, is this uh, you know, out of uh, Thunderball or something That's where so you're going to try to hijack the space, space <laughs> things through your computer systems? Uh, no, but uh, I, I, am a, I would be a high probable cause to be inspected by the uh, security at NASA for sure. Uh, this this big old rig. Uh, you know what I had to do, uh, audience, friends of mine, people who listen, I had to buy my first dehumidifier because I've been in Florida long enough that the RV is finally full of musty smell and the, the only solution we could think of 
uh, is to run the AC 24-7, even when it's 50 degrees, or get the dehumidifier. Yeah, that's what we broke down. In. Or, or come to the 8 o'clock service. That's right. <laughs> You'll smell musty smells. <laughs> So, I still smell musty, but you know, uh, got the we dried out the RV. It took uh, three whole gallon things of water out of the uh, dehumidifier uh, in the last twenty four hours. So, it was it was. Do you miss time. Arizona? <laughs> I miss Arizona a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it was so dry there. In fact, Joe got up, goes, "My hair's all frizzy today." Ah, well, <laughs> that's the dehumidifier working finally. All right, well, let's move on to the news. Uh, a lot's happened in, uh, in Anglicanism this week. A report has been issued by the Church of England. I think uh, George will do some talking about and some of the uh, reactions to that report. It's called the Living, Loving, Lubing, Lusting Report. That's a Julia Robert movie. Uh, eat, right. uh, sleep, and get well. or Something like uh, that. LLF is the acronym yeah. we'll use. Uh, right. Living, Love, and Faith. Mm -hmm. And it's not really a report. It's more of a thing. It's part book, part video, part report, part... Um, it's a mixed bag. And I'll give it credit for effort. But I'll give it a failing grade for practical uh, well, application to the life of the church and the world. What was the goal of the report? Well, about two years ago, there was a flap in the uh, General Center of the Church of England because the General Center was asked to take note of a Bishop's statement on human sexuality that was traditionally minded. And General Synod would do that, which was a bit of a slap at the bishops. And there was politics involved. It wasn't that all of a sudden General Synod became more liberal than it is. And so they've decided to, they decided to put together a study commission uh, to basically begin the dialogue for I don't know how many times <laughs> on human sexuality. So they got together a left-leaning group with some well-meaning conservatives uh, thrown in for balance, and they came out with this report. But the report doesn't make any recommendations. Now, the good things is that there are parts of it where you can see that they really wrestle and engage with Scripture, and they really take seriously what Paul said about uh, Pornea. Uh, sexual morality they don't gloss they don't do some of the stuff the episcopal church did which is either completely ignore paul or take it so far out of its context that oh this only refers to ritual prostitution it doesn't mean paul knew nothing about loving same-sex relationships you know just like the greeks had at that time uh, he knew nothing you. about it because paul was jewish <laughs> and he didn't know anything about the greeks well they don't make that mistake but I'll jump to the end because it, it's not a practical report because it doesn't it doesn't really do anything other than keep the no, keep the volume level uh, up. It doesn't offer any steering no, it other does. than it, we it have to offers, have you. we have to have more talk. We have to we have uh, to unity in this. We have to you know the, the, there's no end game to this this document. No, I'm being very unkind and I'm being very harsh because a lot of people put a lot of time into this and they put their hearts into it and they meant well. And But at the end of the day, what has this accomplished? It's another book that I'll have in my library and a Divinity School library will have, but it will have no real impact in the lives of Christian believers. And the reason why if it gets down to it, is that they refuse to address the elephant in the room, which you just named, Ke Kevin, false unity. Okay. Uh, that, you know, even though we don't agree on how the Bible should be read or what it says or what it means or what's right and what's wrong, we still can call ourselves Anglicans because we agree to disagree about what we disagree about. Uh, yeah. I know that's double negative or triple negative, but that's really the that's situation that we're in. Isn't it? <laughs> and it's this call for fake unity. Uh, at the end of the day, only advantage it only comes to the advantage of those who seek change. There are two camps here. There are those. There are three really. Those who seek change. Those who seek to preserve the unchanging truth of God's word and those who seek to find an accommodation. And when you balance those three equally, 
what it comes down to is favoring the center, finding an accommodation that allows God's word to change, but not by that much, or not by that much today, but maybe tomorrow we'll get a little further along. So it, it really begs the question, at what point do you divorce yourself emotionally from this process if you're in the Church of England? Sure. Now, how that divorce takes place uh, differs from person to person. You know, in my case, in the in the Episcopal Church, my divorce means that I still uh, I still wear the uniform, but I don't salute the flag, because in my little it, here in Hooterville, it doesn't matter what they do in New York. Uh, but if you're uh, in a nasty, hard place where the bishop is telling you to do all these awful things, it's a difficult place. Well, you're not if you're being if you've been kicked out of the Episcopal Church, you don't really have much <laughs> choice, do you? I mean, but that's the reality. There's the, uh, I'm being beaten by my spouse divorce and I'm out of here. And there's the, uh, my spouse isn't paying attention to me anymore. And I mean, I've got one of these great bi-coastal marriages as far as the church is concerned. I live in New York. My wife lives in San Francisco. We see each other for Christmas and Thanksgiving. That's how we stay happily married. <laughs> you hear that sort of nonsense on sure. TV from time to time, but that's the reality of my relationship with the diet of the Episcopal Church. Okay. But, that's where I want to go with this LLF paper in that I think it's problematic because it continues. I, I'll speak now to, the, to that constituency with which I identify, and that's the evangelical way. Mm -hmm. It paints a false hope of that maybe through patience and through reason, we can convince the other side that they're incorrect. Now, all things are possible in the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't deny that. But by using the tools of men, of man, of parliamentary procedure, or dialogue to achieve God's ends, I think you're, you're engaged in a fool's purpose. Absolutely. Well, it talks about in the scripture. You know, they used their own reason. They came to a conclusion with their own reason, and all hell broke loose. Yeah. Why would the this, Church of you know, England be any different? Well, and the other thing is the, the the voices of the evangelical establishment in the Church of England, their loudest call right now is not to biblical faithfulness, but it's to institu institutional faithfulness so that we can be biblically faithful. They, in other words, what, what comes first? The chicken or the egg? The cart, yeah. the cart of the horse. Um, Again, it's easy for me to criticize because I'm not part of it. I'm not, uh, I don't have to make these decisions. But I do feel intuitively and also from conversations I've had with uh, members of the clergy of the Church of England that a great many of them are basically, who are my uh, generation, are just timing things out. But that's an important They're just going to run out the clock. The Episcopal Church and the Church of England are slowly dying. Mm -hmm. I mean, both the institutions themselves are admitting that. The Episcopal Church, or at least through their news organization, says we've only got so long left. If you look at the stats from the Church of England, they only have a decade or two left. Um, and for me, you know, how do I, as an Episcopal priest, live in such a world? And it's because my identity is not in the Episcopal Church, it's in Jesus Christ. The Episcopal Church, if the Episcopal News Service is to be believed, believe, to be believed yeah. will be defunct by the time I time out in my retirement. Um, should that worry me? Well, it will disappoint me. But will the faith of Jesus Christ endure? Absolutely. It can't be defeated, it can't be destroyed. No. At least your pension fund will still be there. I mean, the tech pension system is... Oh, well, they're, they're now into this woke investing. Oh, no. Uh, oh, yes, so it, you know, you so, I mean, uh, early. No. You may early. No, I'm just uh, I'm encouraging my children to study science and medicine <laughs> so that I could live in their garage apartment in my defining years. So what are the reactions then? You talked about the evangelicals, uh, how they reacted to the report what about the lgtv plus 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 community what did they say puff 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 um too little too late yeah uh we posted uh 
actually a friend of this show, our mutual friend, Colin Coward. Sure. He, uh, I like Colin very much as a person. I don't agree with almost anything he says, but he's a really nice guy. Very well, he's good. nice to us. <laughs> Uh, he wrote a, on his blog, he wrote, you know, the annoyance and disappointment of just another half measure of refusing to, as the English say, grasp the nettle, which is actually my criticism, too, is just that he wants to go in one direction. I would hope they would go in another. But Colin is basically saying, you know, look, we've been fighting this fight, talking this talk, doing this all these years. Here are our arguments. Here are our proofs. And he basically sounds exactly like the traditionalists on the other side and this is that false unity well, but and he, at the stage Collins team is the majority and he's basically saying look fellas I have invested the last 30 40 years of my life pushing these issues and we're now in charge why can't we just finally do something and I'm kind of with Colin on this I mean the Church of England is dying anyway just do it just get this over with uh, fully endorse and embrace uh, uh, gay lifestyle gay liturgy within your services and, and just get it over with well I would say let Colin be Colin um, let let Jane Ozan, Jane Ozan be Jane Ozan but don't try to wrap everybody in the same package don't don't make the Church of England Evangelical Council or the society uh, try to fit them into the same mold that uh, the, the affirming uh, side of the equation is in. Okay. All right. This is a free-for-all Friday. We, we did a pre-show, but we didn't write anything down. What was the next topic we're going to talk about? I'm looking here in the Justin end. Welby. Yeah, can you believe it? Um, he, there was a report issued this week that uh, they looked into his uh, involvement with uh, Jonathan Smythe and the time that uh, they worked with the urine camps and uh, it basically concluded that Justin Welby may have had an inkling and that we know he didn't do anything, but for all intents and purposes, he's, he's not guilty of anything. It was, a, it, w it was announced via a press release from Lambeth Palace, uh, so therefore you know it's unbiased. It's <laughs> Uh, it was essentially nothing to see here, folks. Keep moving. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, Justin Welby knew about the Jonathan Smythe, uh, who was the abuser at the British uh, boys' camps. Having been a camper himself, he had been notified officially in 2013. He did nothing. Uh, or he moved it from pile A to pile B, and the church ignored it. And... It was a complaint was made that Justin Welby didn't do what he should have done in light of this massive major scandal within the British church establishment. This isn't some Boy Scout master in the in the wilds molesting a choir boy. This is at the heart of the establishment. Uh, some of his victims are bishops today of the Church of England. Um, boys were driven to suicide. Boys have their lives wrecked. In Zimbabwe, one boy died at this camp mm -hmm. that this that uh, Smythe had to flee England uh, because the, uh, the the evangelical establishment says, you know, get out of the country. We, we know what you're doing. you got to leave. We're not going to turn you over to the police. Welby was part of this establishment. He was a young man when these crimes occurred, but he, the, the accusation was that when he was in a position of authority, he should have known. He was informed, and he did nothing. And the Church of England's uh, safeguarding team came back saying, well, there's no, uh, the case against him is not proven. Which, uh, which in the past could get you what they did to a, a former Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah, you I mean, they... Your rights, privileges, your uh, place in society, and your reputation. Yeah. You know, they're going to give Johnson Tamu a peerage. They're going to make him a permanent member of the House of Lords mm -hmm. uh, because it's his turn. Uh, you know, all these things about that he, you know, we need to make an example of him as the first black archbishop as this, that, and the other, where his personal conduct of having done a horrendous job with the abuse scandal shouldn't count against him. Uh, Welby's the same way. We can nail George Carey for 
unverifiable instances that he may or should have known something third hand 30 years ago. But Justin Welby held to the same standard, case not proven, he continues to be Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, the, uh, the, the primates held a video conference, a uh, two-day video primates meeting in November uh, this past week. And, of course, uh, the GAFCON uh, movers and shakers, Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda, didn't attend. And they probably save themselves. Yes boring two days because they had these well-meaning duds giving them talks about safeguarding and the Archbishop of York telling them how Britain is going to use this LFF to uh, basically finally engage with the issue of homosexuality. Uh, yep. But, they, but the, the, the fog, the bilge coming out of the establishment on these issues, on abuse, on human sexuality, on so much else, on false unity. It's just overwhelming and overpowering. Um, in my own life, I've sort of reached, maybe long ago, but I reached the point that I don't, you know, I don't wait upon the latest word of the Archbishop about what things are, or where they're going to be, because I can almost write his speeches for him. It's so trite and dried and cut and paste from a playbook that is so obvious over well, these years. Then George, you may have a purple collar in your future. If you, oh. could, just, <laughs> if you could just write these, <laughs> it, may, it may be time for you to whip the chain. Um, now, the demographics of this audience are, you know, people 50 plus wearing a collar. And because of that demographic, I wanted to cover the next story. Uh, because a lot, I would say, not a, a majority of viewers, but uh, many viewers of this audience went to gem general seminary. And we have a story this week where the, uh, the dean has stepped down. And the last 15 years of general seminary have not been uh, good. They've lost money. They lost professors. Uh, a lot of chaos going on there. I thought we could give a quick update. This is another tragedy story. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's tempting to play, paint Kurt Dunkel, the outgoing dean of General Seminary, as a villain. And at times, his cartoonishness has almost been, his, his villainy has almost been cartoonish. Uh, yes, Kurt Dunkel uh, was brought on board as, he was canon of the ordinary under John Howard in the Diocese right. of Florida. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that basically ran Howard's campaign that basically forced out Neil Labar and uh, the other people that, for, that formed the nucleus of the Gulf Atlantic Diocese of the ACNA. Um, we had no separate, uh, you notice how that uh, wave stopped at the Florida, Central Florida border. Did, yeah. uh, so you've got to think that, well, there's some people here. This is a people issue, not a local issue. So, well, Dunkel, Dunkel was kicked upstairs to become the first dean without a PhD or doctorate at General Seminary. And he is, uh, he was like Welby. He was a man with experience. He'd been a lawyer. He had been a canon of the ordinary. He had no real pastoral experience, but he could get the job done. And today there are, I think, more trustees, 37, than there are full-time students, 30, at General Seminary. They had had to sell off property. They had four or five years ago, they had the 80 percent of, of the faculty quit and they get fired. And General Seminary is not long for this. It's going to go the way EDS, I believe it will go the way the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, Massachusetts and be merged into a Cambridge EDS went down to merge with Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Right. So it has an office building. It's an office in a building. That's all that's left of that great seminary. And Episcopal Theological, uh, General Theological Seminary, I think it's headed in the same way. Mm. Yeah. It, and the thing is, it's just, I'll, if I were to offer a critique, 
it really is important if you're a bishop, if you're going to be a seminary dean, if you're going to train people how to work in pastoral institutions, to have some pastoral experience yourself. You can't go through a lot. You can't be a rector of a mid middling and larger parish without figuring out how to compromise with people and get things done so things can get done. Sure. Now, if you've got a little congregation of 50 people, you can basically boss everybody around and, you know, you're king of the hill. But if you got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred people, you're going to have people from all over the place coming to different angles, and you're going to have to juggle and balance and try to find ways. You're going to have disgruntled clergy assistants that you have to mollify or figure out how to get rid of. In other words, you have to have the real life experience of how the church operates on the ground. And too many of these, you know, Dunkel have had that. He had a very short time in the pastoral ministry. Because he was an attorney, he was made canon of the ordinary, and he was made an administrator. But he didn't know how to administer how to administer the people under who he was given for whom he was given supervision. And that failure was carried up to the seminary level. Yeah. It's a sad thing to, to watch, you know, these great seminaries of the past fail, and uh, a collapse, obviously. Uh, there's there's a couple left. Uh, there's certainly some good ACNA version uh, seminaries out there. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to see this because that was Siri. <laughs> Sorry, Siri. Um, and it, it's hard to watch this happen. Uh, before we finish up, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about presidential politics again. Uh, presumptive presidential elect Biden. Uh, seems to think he's the clear winner here. There's a lot of hope I see on Facebook and Twitter uh, of the, the the Rebel Alliance, so to speak, uh, hoping to overturn the vote or find out how they cheated. Clearly there's, you know, every election has fraud. This election certainly had some fraud. Uh, and it's a, the onus of the president and his team to prove major fraud. And if he can do it, great. Let's get this, you know, taken care of. But this is just a, a collective stress on us during the time of COVID. This is so 2020, George. Yeah, um, we'll see how it turns out. Uh, we we're being fed a diet by the ma uh, the mainstream media that there is no evidence of widespread fraud. Baseless, and, they say. Baseless. And guess what? That's what the Trump team says, too. Yeah. They're talking about targeted fraud. Sure. There was no fraud in my little county. Uh, there was no, in Florida, you know, nobody on either side is questioning the election because after the Chad fiasco 20 years ago, Florida went through some very strenuous reforms mm -hmm. and you have to have ID, you have to do, mail-in ballots are counted before any other ballots. They're not dropped in the middle of the night and so on, so, you know, all that stuff. Well, the uh, Joe Biden cannot do the Constitution gives the power to proclaim a president, not to the media. I'm not saying Biden won. I'm not saying he didn't won, but I'm saying it's pretty premature and absolutely ludicrous to say that there's no evidence of targeted fraud. Um, you have the uh, Rudy Giuliani and other attorneys going into courts in Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and so far, and there may be other states that will come with affidavits of poll workers and election monitors and actually employees of the city election boards making uh, these under, te under sworn testimonies of this, they witnessed this or they were told to do this. That is evidence. Sure. Now, the other thing you need to remember, well, I'm not you, Kevin, but the general you, Generally. is that this is not a criminal trial. No. This only has to be a preponderance of evidence. It's a civil case. So the, the court, you do not need to prove without a shadow of a doubt, as you do in a criminal case. You need to show that it's more likely than not. And then the courts decide on what sort of... Uh, uh, 
actions do we take in light of the evidence or preponderance of evidence? See that that's why you can that's why the you know statistical the statistical arguments people will dismiss out of hand saying well they're not under comprehensible. But statistical arguments uh, saying that you know the that the 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 methodology used by insurance companies and bank examiners and other financial invest financial authorities to investigate fraud using these tools they use statistical analyses. Mm -hmm. And they show that there's a likelihood. And once you have that likelihood in civil cases, then things get stopped and you go forward uh, to do the detailed investigation. And what the Trump administration appears to be doing is uh, following this pattern that you do in pr proving financial fraud, uh, gathering the affidavits, but also gathering the macro information showing that that uh, like the probability of uh, the way that the votes came in milwaukee or in michigan or in philadelphia um, there's a one billion to one chance that it could have happened that way under normal circumstances yeah there's a reality that's their argument I don't, that's their argument i don't know if it's true or not there there is a reality that, that there's certain statistics here that set off the red flags you know uh, shutting down the counting at night, adding the uh, 130,000 extra votes at night, you know, done under the cover under darkness. The thing is, uh, if we can't, if this can't be proven before December 14th when the Electoral College meets, you know, the, the, the you know. Well, well, here's the thing that the, um, like in Philadelphia, the law is quite, Pennsylvania law is quite clear that there must be a Republican and a Democrat to view the votes you just can't do it without republicans present right and the penalty of that is those votes aren't counted so the argument being put forward by the republicans in pennsylvania is that these several hundred thousand votes cannot be counted under the clear plain reading of the law it may not be fair to the people but that's the fault of the election board uh yeah. not the people who voted so if it is certified, then it goes to the state legislatures, and the state legislatures are the check against local election authorities. If they think fraud took place, the state legislatures are in their rights to say, we don't agree with this. And in fact, we think fraud took place, and we'll certify a different set of electors. Now, in this particular, now we're getting into brass tacks, but in five of the six states that are a question, and there are only six states where there's been accusations of targeted fraud. Um, the legislatures, the governor, the legislatures are controlled by the Republicans in five of the six states. So in Pennsylvania, for example, if the elections boards in Philadelphia return, well, there was a million votes for Joe Biden, even though only 400,000 people were registered in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, They'll, that'll go into the total and the election and they'll gather all the county totals and it will say oh my goodness joe biden won by this six hundred thousand margin now the arguments we put forward well that's possible it's this that and the other but it's up to the legislature to decide what that's the check and balance in our system that the founding fathers set up this happened in the election of 18 i think it was 1880 tilden versus hayes yeah this ha happened of uh, the elect the legislatures being a check against local fraud, because at the end of the day, we have to remember the president is not elected by popular vote. The president is elected by the state legislators, who rely upon a popular vote to award the delegates to the electoral college. But it is we're in a republic where we elect local legislatures, who in essence elect the president by means of the uh, popular vote being the guide. If you guys ever get a chance, go read the 12th Amendment to the Constitution. That's no, a but fun let, one. let me pause, let me pause, <laughs> yeah, let me pause for one second. Yeah. I am not saying that this is 100% proven. No. I am just telling you what the arguments See, 
here's the problem. I'm married to a Philadelphia lawyer. <laughs> I'm married to a woman who, before she had started having babies, practiced in the appellate courts in Pennsylvania and yeah. was actually a clerk at the Commonwealth Court, which in Philadelphia, which gave the that this win the other day to Donald Trump. So some of you may have your sweet nighttime discussions about love and life and mine. Uh, because my wife is in Seattle, ours are uh, over Pennsylvania election laws and how these things oh were going out there. <laughs> so, uh, so, but please hear me to say, I'm not saying this is 100% proven or true. I'm just telling you what the arguments are being put forward. And, and here's the question. I mean, are there red flags? Absolutely. Is this worth investigating? Absolutely. The red flags are very red. Um, do we know the outcome? No, we don't. We'll just have to sit and be patient and, and pray our way through this. That's what we did 20 years ago. Well, if the Electoral yeah. College, you know, if Pennsylvania, for instance, refuses to certify and we hit that deadline you mentioned, Kevin, do you know what happens then? It goes to the Congress. And the Congress, it goes to the House of Representatives. House, yeah. And the House of Representatives votes. Oh, well, doesn't that mean the Democrats will win because they've got like a 10 or 20 vote spread? No, Seven it doesn't. Vote. Seven vote now. It doesn't because they do it by state. Each state delegation has one vote. Yeah. And I believe there are 26 or 27 Republican delegations, majority mm -hmm. delegations. So California may have 30 more Republican Democratic congressmen and women than Republicans. And Wyoming may have one Republican. Politics. But California's vote, one for for the Democrats, equals the same vote as Wyoming's one Republican. That's the way our system was set up. Mm -hmm. So it looks like, if you, if, you, if you ask me to gamble, I would say there's a 70% probability that uh, Donald Trump will win. Statistically hey. speaking. Hey, but remember, don't take investment advice from the two of us. Don't take political advice from the two of us. You're listening to a priest in Hooterville, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, where the swamp is rising and the alligators are coming out because of all the rain. So if you trust that man for your inside information, you need to be aware of the source. You do. You do. Absolutely. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 631 of Anglican Unscripted.